Um, so I'm David, and this work has been done with Jörg Müller from Aarhus University and Professor Mark Alexe from TU Berlin. So we present an approach for creating physical interfaces that change their perceived shape, but purely optically. Changes performed within milliseconds, like with the, for this lampshade, and without mechanically moving parts or actuation. These, how we call them, transparency-controlled physical interfaces can change their appearance, for example, perform changes in perceived size or change their perceived shape. They're built from optically dynamic material, therefore unwanted parts are hidden and blend into the environment. I'm going to show you multiple examples, for example, this uh, ambient display, disk space indicator, um, that changes its height dependent on the on this, um, space left on the disk. So if you look at the related work, there are really two types of dynamic physical interfaces. On the one hand, we have optically dynamic interfaces, and on the other hand, we have shape-changing interfaces. Here are two examples of um, optically dynamic interfaces. For example, the work by Dalsgaard and colleagues, where they uh, augmented objects placed on a tabletop with projection um, for a richer interaction. This year at CHI, we also explored how we can combine shape-changing interfaces with spatial augmented reality for an extended object appearance. So both the techniques, projection mapping and spatial augmented reality, have the goal of creating the illusion of a physically dynamic surface. However, both, uh, however, they require at least knowing the user's location for perspective-corrected rendering, and they require a suitable projection surface. On the other hand, we have shape-changing interfaces. For example, work by Yao and colleagues on pneumatic uh, user interfaces, or the work by Fall and colleagues on shape displays, both presented here at WIST. They offer very rich, tangible qualities. However, they are limited in their speed of actuation, and they only have a limited resolution in, in contrast to, let's say, displays. Certain features, for example, like decreasing the size or creating holes into the interface are also very challenging to achieve from a mechanical point of view. So this brings us really to the motivation of our, of our work. We wanted to create 3D objects with dynamic appearance, but we wanted to avoid mechanically moving parts, and we wanted to avoid instrumentation of the user or the environment. So our optically dynamic properties should be tightly integrated into the objects or interfaces. <clears throat> so this is why we created these transparency-controlled physical interfaces. I'll start off with a design space to show you the capabilities um, of, of, this, of our concept. So the goal was to create interfaces with arbitrary 3D shape, and they should have individually controllable pieces. Or, um, and we want to build them from optically dynamic material. In our current uh, implementation, this is polymer dispersed liquid crystal switchable diffuser. So our design space have, has five different dimensions, which are phase, object, and composition, as well as control area and control type. Each object is uh, composed of multiple phases, and we distinguish them by how we control them. So the first one is uh, where we actually control the full phase. So it toggles between, or it can change from opaque to transparent. We can also include certain sprites. You can think of them as graphics into the interface, like the star here. We can also control those individually. And thirdly, for phase, we have segmented. So the phase is visually subdivided into multiple pieces, although physically it's really just one. When we look at an object level or the dimension object, we have regular open or closed object, like the cube you see here. And if one phase would be miss missing, it would be an open object. One very unique property of our um, of, uh, of transparency control physical interfaces is that we can actually nest objects. So here you see a cube in a cube in a cube, <clears throat> each of which can be controlled individually. The object can be part of a composition, or if it's not, it's a standalone object. So here, for example, to indicate status. Transparency control physical interfaces can all be part of a compound. So here you see the um, example of a, a prototype phone with transparency control capabilities. So it's integrated into a regular object. 
For control area, we can either control the entire object as well for more expressiveness, we can control them in a segmented way, so each, in, uh, each piece individually. And in terms of control type, we can control um, the interfaces continuously, so here you see a slow change in transparency, um, and, or we can control them binary, for example, for notifications. So this is our, our, uh, our the five dimensions of the, our design space, and it shows you that we have a very rich set of possible shapes. And all the apparent change in shape is purely optically. So let me show you how we actually um, uh, implemented this. In terms of hardware, we had the goals to create optically dynamic 3D objects from individually controllable, controllable pieces. So how did we achieve the optically dynamic part? So as I said, our base material is polymer dispersed liquid crystal uh, switchable diffuser, which in its default state is opaque. To be more specific, it actually ref um, incoming light is diffused um, by the liquid crystal, so it looks opaque or um, more diffuse. If we now apply voltage to it, more uh, specifically 110 volts, the liquid crystal orients, so they turn uh, become parallel, and incoming light can pass through. So this is the optically dynamic part, and switchable diffuser has been used um, by us and also by others of this community uh, multiple times. So how do we create 3D objects? So the initial idea would be we could just create um, 3D objects from individual faces, as here where we use black switchable diffuser, for example, um, to create these individual faces, and this is our first prototype of a lamp. However, the problem is it requires some kind of support structure like this here to actually mount the individual faces. This support structure decreases visual clarity um, and doesn't scale very well. So it, things get, um, so it doesn't look that nice. So we were asking ourselves, how can we create three objects from a single piece of switchable diffuser? Switchable diffuser, uh, if you use it as a regular material, does have... Um, does, uh, is a bit flexible, however, if you bend it upon to a certain degree, it actually breaks. So what we want to do is we want to release tension to avoid this damage of the material, and this is where living hinges come into play. We tested different patterns how we can actually create the living hinges, but we ended up with these patterns you see on the top, um, and we actually cut the switchable diffuser in order to create these living hinges. The crease patterns also govern the band radius, so the simple crease pattern on the left gives you a very sharp angled band, whereas um, the, on the right you get more round edges. And it, they also govern the bending stiffness. So um, the simple pattern is a very high bending stiffness, and uh, the more uh, cuts you make, the lower the bending stiffness gets. So by adding a couple of snap fits on the outline, we can now already create 3D objects from switchable diffuser. One of the nice properties here is that although we cut the switchable diffuser with the laser cutter, it still retains its uh, transparency control properties. So I can fold it to basically arbitrary angles, however it's, I can still control if it's transparent or not. So this is how we create 3D objects. Now how can we create individually controllable pieces? An initial idea again would be why not wire each face individually? However things get messy very fast as you see in this prototype, actually very messy. So the wiring of individual faces doesn't scale very well. And it also decreases visual clarity and each connection of this uh, with copper tape, how we actually connect it, is prone to failure. Uh, we already have a material where we, where we need to apply voltage, so why not route the voltage directly into the diffuser? So what we did is, if you look at switchable diffuser, which has the liquid crystals in the top and an insulating and conductive layer on the bottom and, uh, on the, bottom and the top. So what we do is, we uh, cut one layer of the switchable diffuser in order to separate the individual areas we want to control. So here you have side A and side B. If we wire these things up now, we can use the intact layer of the switchable diffuser as a common electrode, and the other side A and B we can control individually through switches. If we now look at, uh, at the switchable diffuser from the top, we can see, so this is the living hinge, that um, 
regularly we have one route for the switchable diffuser. And what we mean by we route voltage uh, on different errand is we actually separate different areas of the switchable diffuser. So if here the red thing uh, is a cut, and now we get two different routes, routes A and B. However, we get a problem if we want to have more than two routes. So we have route A and B. However, for C, um, we have the problem that the electrical connection is interrupted by the cut from the laser cutter. So what we need to do is we actually need to adjust the hinge patterns. So for the simple um, hinge pattern, we can do one or two routes. However, we uh, divide the hinge pattern further to create more routes. So for the hardware, we create the living hinges which allow for folding and the electrical connection. We cut one side of the diffuser to create these individually controllable pieces without any external wiring with just one connector. And we can adjust the hinge, we adjust the hinge pattern to allow for multiple controllable pieces. This allows us to create things like this one where each of the blue areas uh, you see here is actually uh, individually uh, addressable. And if you then fold it up, you get something like this. I call it flower shape, not sure if that's correct, um, of this um, interface. In terms of software, I'll briefly walk you through with this um, example of a box with three individually controllable pieces. So to create a transparency controlled physical interface, it's a three-step process. So we first design the origami shape, then we cut, uh, then we create the crease and cut pattern, and then we fold and uh, fo cut, fold and connect the, um, the object. So for designing the origami shape, we have currently a manual process. So we use Illustrator with an origami plugin um, to create the outline as well as the crease patterns. However, it's easily imagine, uh, imaginable that you use some kind of automatic unfolding, for example, as used by Albuding and colleagues on Foldio last year at Kite. Or, no, wait, sorry. <clears throat> the second part is to create this uh, cut and crease pattern. So we have our custom software, which does some semi-automatic processing. It creates snap fits, hinges, the routing, and the user can add the connector. And it output, outputs the cut plan for a laser cutter. So the user imports the manually designed shape, and our software um, provides some 3D preview uh, also with, with uh, where the user can see the unfolding. Our software then automatically adds the snap fits to the outline to, uh, to be able to kind of that the 3D object holds together, as well as the living hinges here with a, a regular simple hinge pattern. The user then manually adds the connector um, for connecting our press fit connector we use um, and positions it. And then the user specifies individually controllable areas. In this case, we have three separate areas we want to control. Our software, after this, uh, automatically adjusts the hinge pattern. And you see here, two of the hinge patterns got adjusted because more than two routes are needed. As the last step, the user routes, um, routes, uh, so uh, performs the separation or routing in order to be able to address these individually controllable areas, um, which could also be um, done in a more automatic process. This is what you, what you see here is basically the output for the laser cutter. The last step of this three-step process is actually the manufacturing. So you, the, um, the user puts, it, puts the material into, it, into the laser cutter and cuts it, and after a bit of folding, the only thing left to do is actually just um, to actually connect it, and then uh, you can already control each of those pieces individually. So we created multiple applications to showcase our concept. For the first is we create this, um, as you've seen already, our flower-shaped notification indicators. For example, if the phone rings, you have this uh, very unobtrusive and nice pattern to actually indicate that uh, something is going on. The second application is our disk space indicator where the height or volume of the, um, of the artifact is actually increased um, with um, the more space is taken up on the thumb drive. It also adapts to if, if more files are uh, actually added onto the drive. Our third application is this moving avatar with individually controllable legs. So you see that uh, each of the legs can be controlled individually. And we measure displacement here um, in order to create kind of this illusion of motion. This object is also a very nice example of, uh, of a compound object. So in the center, we uh, included a regular computer mouse 
to measure the displacement and then added this transparency control um, capabilities on the outside. As a fourth example, we explored the combination with a shape-changing interface. So here it's our prototypical shape-changing phone where we can actually have this transparency control area in the center um, to make it see-through or on the flaps we can actually um, see how, the mechanic, how it's working mechanically, for example, for debugging, teaching, or purely aesthetics. Our last example is a, is a, a shape-changing lampshade, um, which is a nested object with a, uh, with a pyramid inside a dodecahedron inside a cube. Um, so we can pulse interior exterior la layers, for example, for notifications, um, or again, just because it looks cool. So to conclude, we created our transparency controlled physical interfaces. Those are optically dynamic 3D objects with individually controllable parts without the need for individual wire, for external wiring. The dynamic appearance of the object can be performed without, without any kind of mechanical actuators and it can be standalone or as a compound. If you've seen our demo yesterday, there are still a couple of limitations. So the first one is the viewing angle. With the PDLT switchable diffuser, um, it influences the transparency negative if you have an obliged viewing angle. Also layering and routing influence transparency and visual clarity respectively. Also, as many other optically dynamic interfaces, we don't have any dynamic tangible qualities. However, we have the benefits of that apparent physical change is performed purely optically. The change is tightly integrated into objects and interfaces, and we have benefits in terms of speed and power consumption, and also we have um, benefits in terms of rendering capabilities so we can easily increase volume or render holes. So that's it for my talk. Um, if you, um, I would uh, ask you to also visit the website where we open source the hardware and software um, of our project. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Okay, so, oh, right there. Hi, uh, thank you, and very interesting work. I'm uh, Roshan from KU University. Hi. Uh, have you thought about making this wearable, and what are the limitations? I heard the voltage is quite high. So, um, that's true. So, we currently require 110 uh, volts AC. However, it's very low current. So if you know electroluminescence wire, for example, which is used in wearables, I mean, you can buy it in out of food. It, I think it has an even higher voltage. However, because of the low current, it's not dangerous. Um, I think you, we already tried it with these EL wired um, um, kind of power, uh, power things, however, and that already works very, um, or it kind of it works if you don't have too big objects. Um, so I think you could make it wearable, and there is already a project which uses switchable diffuser for, for dresses. Um, so they kind of, the more you share uh, online, the more transparent really the dress gets, which is a very interesting project. Um, so I think you can use this ver in a variable manner. Um, however, I think it's, you have to work a bit on the circuitry. I mean, what we really want to do is kind of we want to create these 3D objects. Um, so um, for the variable, I think there are, there are applications where we want to have it variable and then maybe 3D too. Hi, uh, nice talk. Uh, this is Ken from MIT Media Lab. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, for application. I was thinking um, maybe uh, I was thinking if you were, did uh, think about applications more like really utilizing the transparency because the cool thing is that you can like control the visibility of like more like the environment and or it can be like a tangible user interface on top of display that shows hide something or something dynamically. But I don't know. And that's one question for application and second for technical one is it have you think about like uh, doing getting input using sensor as well so it can be touch input or whatever yeah okay so I'll start with the second question because I still remember it um, so we didn't include input here but our, however we already tried um, and if you can actually measure the presence of touch onto on the on the film um, so that's the first one. So you can use it. Um, however, I think it would rather include maybe an additional layer of, ca say, capacitive sensing, like a transparent um, touch sensor on top of it, um, which doesn't uh, influence the, the clarity. For the applications, um, 
So, I, I mean, uh, what we also already did, so I think the combination with uh, tangible or shape-changing user interfaces is very interesting because both have kind of, um, kind of their, their, um, their benefits. Um, so we are definitely, as you've seen with the kind of our shape-changing phone, um, we are already kind of, we are trying to explore this area too. Um, for, to utilize transparency more, I mean, we kind of, um, we wanted to explore how we can actually kind of do shape change without kind of physical shape change. Um, however, um, for example, we can easily expose electronic components um, and kind of utilize this more. And two years ago, we already used this material, for example, for transparency controlled display. So um, it's definitely kind of the combination that makes this uh, tech cool. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have time for one quick one. Right there? Hi, I'm Ben Utram from uh, K University. Hi. Um, so I used to work on liquid crystal displays a bit, so I was curious as to, like, I really like this idea of the diffusion um, liquid poly polymer dispersed liquid crystal. I was wondering, you could also maybe use, like, um, a cholesteric uh, reflective liquid crystal um, uh, mode. What do you think about that? That would be like tr switching between transparent and sort of colored or reflective. What do you, yeah. So, so. Um, I think the more capabilities we would have in, in, uh, in kind of in the, in the material, the more interesting it gets. We were actually also thinking there is this kind of, there's this material which changes between transparent, opaque, and being a mirror. Um, however, it's more expensive than you can imagine, like 2,000 bucks for this piece. Um, so I think the, the more you add in capabilities, the more really interesting it gets. So I think we, it's kind of really an area we want to explore where we say, hey, we can not only control transparency, but color or reflectance or different surface properties too. Can I speaker again?